Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Natalia Kuznetsova, and I will talk to you about uh, product management, machine learning, and artificial intelligence products. Uh, before we start, let me do a quick introduction so you would understand where I come from and why I would want to talk about machine learning. Uh, I have over 10 years of experience with product management. For the last two years, I've been with Meta as a senior product management. And before, I worked with Boogie.com and a search engine called Yandex. Uh, most of my career, I worked with products like search, personalization, monetization that rely on machine learning. Hence, my interest in the topic, hence the topic of this uh, uh, talk today. I also hold an MBA degree from Bocconi University in Milan, Italy. Before we start, if you have any questions or would like to get in touch with any other reason after this talk, uh, please reach out via LinkedIn. This is the link to my profile. And uh, let's get started. Um, I would like to structure uh, this talk today in the following way. First, we talked about machine learning products and how they are built and what's so special about the development process uh, to better understand the laser foundation for the additional expectations that the male product managers have. And finally, what a different path available for you or anyone else to become a machine learning product manager if you choose so. Okay, so machine learning products. I would like to start with talking about uh, the terminology here. Uh, we can talk about machine learning, we can talk about artificial intelligence, pretty much interchangeably for all intents and purposes, especially in the context of business, marketing, or sales. But strictly speaking, we need to understand that artificial intelligence is a broader field and a broader problem than machine learning. Artificial intelligence is about teaching computers to think broadly. And machine learning is about teaching computers to perform specific tasks that they can learn from data. Machine learning is often leveraged to achieve uh, tasks, goals of artificial intelligence, but strictly speaking, it's not the same. Um, however, uh, as I said, you can use them pretty much interchangeably. However, when you talk to your ML development team, typically you would want to use terms like machine learning. It's more common, at least in my experience. Okay, now a little bit more about uh, the role of machine learning in different uh, products. Here, I try to visualize a scale which reflects uh, the importance or criticality, the weight that machine learning models uh, have uh, in different products. In one side, on the left side of the scale, you can see that uh, machine learning pretty much is a product. It has a thin wrapper of user interface around it, but still most of the functionality is coming from the model itself. So the examples here would be generative AIs, such as ChatGPT or DALI, or uh, Google search engine. The model is the product here. On the other side of the scale, you can see, for example, product recommendations on e-commerce websites like Amazon's or uh, recommendations on Netflix. So even though the core uh, task or the core functionality of the product not necessarily related to ML, ML enhances this and makes the experience more engaging uh, for the end user. So in that case, machine learning is, uh, is a nice to have, but usually pretty important for, for business outcomes anyway. And then you have uh, many products in the middle. I just put two examples here. One is virtual assistants that rely on speech recognition synthesis. And then we have robotics and, uh, for example, self-driving cars that rely on computer vision uh, to be able to uh, function autonomously. So in this case, uh, machine learning is okay, half of the functionality compared to everything else that included in the product. So despite uh, the wide difference uh, of uh, ML functionality within the product, the good, the good, uh, uh, the good side is that uh, the development principles for all these machine learning uh, models remain the same, regardless of the product. And this is what I'm gonna talk to you about now. So what do you need for machine learning, for developing machine learning models? Um, Broadly, there are two types of resources. 
The first two are the building blocks, things that you absolutely need to actually be able to build the model, which is the data and the algorithm, that is the code that allows you to train models. This is on uh, like abstract philosophical plane, so to say. On the practical side, you need the infrastructure and people with dedicated skills to actually implement that. Now let's dig into each of them a little bit deeper. Data. Data is the foundation of machine learning. If there is no data, there is no machine learning. Uh, but what do we mean by data here more specifically? For the purpose of machine learning, we talk about data as a structured information about the entity that we want to model or predict and the signals that we are going to leverage to achieve that. Uh, to give you an example, uh, say we want to predict uh, clicks on search results in a search engine. The clicks would be the entities that we model. Uh, the technical term for it would be a label. And all the user behavior information, all the information about different search results shared in the query and the search query itself, those are going to be signals. In technical terms, they're going to be called features. So we're going to leverage features to be able to predict uh, the label, that is the click. Uh, when I talk about structured data, that's what I mean. This example is a Boston housing data set, so one of the public data sets that you can find on the internet. So here you can see a list of uh, different features, you may say different characteristics of uh, houses in the Boston area. And you, can ha and you have the label here as well, which is a price. So this data set is uh, used for uh, like benchmarking or testing different types of uh, models or modeling approaches because it's a public domain, uh, leverage the features to predict the label. You can see it's uh, here is presented as a top separated uh, 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 file. Uh, so this is how you can think about any training data set. Then uh, algorithms. Uh, in short, this is a code that actually allows you to learn from signals or features to predict the label. It could be as simple, uh, quote unquote, simple as linear regression or as complex as deep learning, meaning uh, neural networks. Um, there are many different types of algorithms. Uh, it's not that one, any one is better than the other. For different tasks and different circumstances, you would want to use different algorithm. Here are just three examples uh, from linear regression on the right, uh, neural network on, uh, sorry, on the left, neural network on the right, and in the middle you have an ensemble, which is a technical term for a combination of a few uh, decision trees, which are independent models and then combine in a bigger model. Moving on to the plane of the real world, um, how do you actually make this happen in the real world? So first of all, you need infrastructure. If you are going after complex advanced models, or if you are going to serve them at large scale, you will need uh, dedicated data storage and compute capacity. This is one of the reasons why ML can be expensive. And finally, the foundation of all is people. Uh, as with data, machine learning is impossible without people. You need to have uh, the dedicated talent, specialized talent that will be able to actually train the model, leveraging the data. Uh, this role is called differently different companies. It's some companies it's called data scientists, it's some companies it's called uh, machine learning engineer. But uh, this ultimately is the people who will be training the models. On top of that, uh, typically you also need to have data engineers who are uh, accountable for uh, procuring high quality data and infrastructure engineers that need to make sure that the entire stack works end-to-end uh, -end, from data storage and processes, to model training, to serving the model in production in an efficient, reliable way. Uh, all these roles, all this talent is another reason why well, is expensive. So now let's uh, uh, talk a little bit about how the um, uh, machine product development cycle looks like. 
So I uh, outline here four steps. You can actually think about the three steps. So first step, uh, this is about training a model candidate, right? So here there are two sides. One is about preparing the data, and another one is actually selecting and fine-tuning the algorithm that will then produce the model. So preparation of data uh, might sound trivial, but in practice it's not. So aside uh, from uh, um, cleaning the data, making sure that there is not much noise in it and so on, the non-trivial part is typically um, creating uh, the relevant signals, the relevant features for the models to leverage during training. And this is, uh, this is quite a creative process. And uh, that's why data preparation is uh, an important step of any machine learning uh, project. And then we have a training and tuning the model. Here, we need to select the right algorithm for the problem and for the data at hand, and uh, we need to tune it. Um, without going into technical details, you can spend quite a bit of time on improving uh, the algorithm even after you selected it. So let's say you prepare the data, you train and tune the model, then you evaluate it offline. Evaluation offline typically means uh, that we are looking at the prediction errors, uh, no matter what we are predicting, we are classifying we just to uh, want to pinpoint a specific numbers in the regression task, doesn't matter. So there's always going to be some error in predictions, and we just want to get it to be small. As soon as it's small or smaller than the previous iteration of the model had, you might choose uh, to consider its success and test it in production environment. The most Typical case of test in a production environment would be an A-B test, a split test. When you test your model, either against no model or against the previous version, and you observe the relevant metrics as a business metrics. So and if you see a success, that you move the metrics in the way that you wanted them to move, you ship it to production. And typically, you start all over again. That was the happy path of the development process, typically, it takes more than one iteration between training the model, evaluating it offline, and then usually going back to retraining the model because the performance could be better or it's not what you expected. So it takes a few cycles there usually. And then you can also get more than one cycle between uh, uh, getting uh, a decent result offline and getting the results that you wanted online. Uh, if it sounds, uh, Counterintuitive. Uh, okay, not much I can do about that. Overall, you would expect a fair, a positive correlation between offline and online results. However, you cannot count on them uh, in hundred percent of cases. Uh, there are many, many. There are many reasons why you can observe this discrepancy. One reason could be there are some technical problems in the experiment. For example. Uh, the model didn't work as expected. For example, it did not, uh, uh, it wasn't getting the features, the signals to actually compute the score, it worked as expected, or there was some high fallback rate or some simplistic solution behind it. Or, for example, uh, if you are testing your model embedded as a small feature in the broader interface, there could have been some UI changes that change the visibility of your module, uh, which uh, which made it harder for you to uh, actually capture the impact that you wanted to, the effect that you wanted to see as an experiment, and so on. So many different reasons why you can see discrepancy between steps two and three. Uh, in most cases, you should see them align. If not, uh, usually it's good to prepare like a list of uh, Hypothesis that you would want to check if something is going as it is, is not going as you expect it to go. Um, one more thing to say in this slide is typically it takes a few weeks, if not a month, to actually get success. Uh, so ML typically does have long development cycles. And uh, to summarize uh, the differences or uh, special aspects of machine learning uh, products. Um, so on one side, you have high performance that comes at a high cost. 
And this is what makes them special. So it's expensive. So you want it to perform well. And high performance is what uses a wow effect for your users. Uh, typically, the performance you can get with sufficiently advanced machine learning models, you cannot get it uh, in any other way. You cannot write rules. You cannot uh, do some simple computations and put some, I don't know, magical content, constants in place. Advanced ML, you cannot beat it. So if it's sufficiently impactful for your uh, product, for your use case, there's nothing better than ML at the end of the day. Another plus of ML is that uh, it can adapt to a change in, uh, say, user behavior or any other like environmental behaviors. Um, assuming that you retrain the module regularly to supply this data that contains this new behavior, these new patterns, then it scales well, for example, you started with this one user segment and then you want to apply to another user segment, it should scale well as long as you have sufficient uh, capacity to do so. And if you actually ace uh, machine learning and you really tuned it well, it works really well, it uh, gives you sustainable competitive edge as a business because it's not easy to do. And also, this is a skill that you can apply to other problems, leveraging the same technology and uh, get another uh, great outcome there. So that's why ML is uh, about high performance. But this high performance comes at a high cost. As we discussed already, it requires specialized talent. Uh, and this is a talent that you cannot uh, repurpose for any other project. So I'm sure the engineers are not going to work on front end. They're not going to work on back end. They only, yeah, they're only going to work on machine learning. So if you hire, uh, machine learning engineers, if you stand up a um, machine learning team, you need to make sure that you have a sufficient backlog for them to work on for a while, not just a one-off project. Then talk about infrastructure. Uh, so if you are serving a uh, complex, heavy models at scale, you need to make special investment in the compute capacity and data storage. Uh, long development cycles. Uh, this might be uncomfortable for people, for example, who are used to small step optimizations, which is a very effective optimization strategy on its own. But here, together with the opacity that is put here as a last bullet point, uh, can make a lot of people uncomfortable who don't have experience working with a man. And finally, maintenance. Uh, machine learning is complex, and there are a lot of things that need to work together well for it to be as effective as was intended to. For example, you need to make sure that all the important signals are always delivered to your model in real time so you can actually you know, compute the scores and do whatever you need to do with those scores. Uh, your model needs to be retrained regularly to capitalize on the fresh signal, fresh patterns, uh, characters in the data. Um, all of that uh, needs to work well, this is just only for production serving, right? So maintenance and uh, monitoring and debugging is going to be another expensive part of machine learning. Okay, so we discussed uh, machine learning products and what is so particular about them. So now let's talk a little bit more about the role of machine learning uh, product managers. So to start, it started the good news. Uh, good news is machine learning product managers are still product managers, which means that all the core uh, competencies, the expectations are the same. So it's about setting direction for a team, defining and measuring success, and supporting the team throughout the execution. If we were to summarize it just one word, creating extreme clarity for all of your stakeholders, the team, uh, sponsors, dependencies, partners, all should be super clear on what you are doing, why you're doing that, and how you're going to achieve it. However, since uh, machine learning is special, so there are also a few extra requirements that MLPMs uh, uh, will need to fulfill. Um, I uh, put them in four buckets. Uh, um, cannot say that this increasing or decreasing priority or importance, all of them are important. So everything starts with actually understanding the tech. 
to be comfortable uh, working with machine learning team, selecting the right products for this, uh, sorry, selecting the right problems for this team, uh, and setting the right expectations of your stakeholders, you need to understand uh, how the tech actually works and how the development cycle actually looks. Um, and there's no way around it. If you want to be effective, you need to understand the tech. I'm not saying that you need to go and get a degree in uh, uh, computer science specialization, machine learning, but you need to understand the basics. As a next step further, you will likely have to also champion the tech and the product that you build and your team, because despite the uh, wide and wider application of machine learning everywhere, there is still a lot of people who are skeptical about it, so or maybe overly optimistic about it. So you need to be able to manage the expectations so both these groups of stakeholders. Then uh, regulations. Uh, regulations, uh, uh, there are already some regulations in place that will impact your work as machine learning product managers and more likely coming given the boom of generative AI. So you need to keep an eye on that because they will uh, limit uh, your access to certain data and they also impose uh, stricter uh, requirements on how and when you can deploy ML and what criteria it should meet if you choose to do so. And finally, you need to plan for scalability. This goes back to the point about it might be expensive, so you need to make sure that you are making the most out of it if you choose to invest in it. Okay, now a little bit more on each of the uh, axes here. Understanding the technology. As I said already, it's, uh, in my view, vital for success in this role. You need to understand the fundamentals. Uh, this goes to uh, understanding what good problems to solve with ML are, because not everything can or even should be solved with ML. Good ML candidates are, uh, project candidates are about uh, identifying complex patterns in data, especially if the environment is changing. For example, user behavior is constantly changing or the inventory of products is changing all the time. And you have a lot of data to be actually able to learn from them and understand those patterns and use them for your purposes. Uh, if something can be addressed by one-off analysis and well-written rules or heuristics and magical constant, it's okay. You don't have to do it with ML then. So you need to be very clear about when it's worth investing in the ML. The next thing here is uh, to lead the ML team effectively. Uh, you need to build trust, and you build trust by showing your understanding of the work and the complexity, so the nuance. Uh, it also gives you the, uh, um, the foundations uh, to, how should I say, to challenge your team in the right way, to make sure that they are still working on the right problems, that they're focusing their efforts in the right areas. So again, understanding is important. And finally, ML is a super powerful, uh, amazing technology, but ML models are still models, meaning that they are a simplified representation of reality, of some process, any sort of phenomenon, which means that uh, not all the nuance is going to be picked from the data, no matter how advanced the model is. And uh, if there are any biases in the data, ML will amplify it exactly because it's just uh, like roughens up what it observes in the data. For example, if you're building a tool uh, for helping recruiters uh, identify more promising candidates and you're looking at historical data of uh, hiding in tech, and if you are not careful, uh, your model might learn, that, for example, women are not good candidates for technical jobs because the majority of technical roles in history be occupied by men. So this one example of how your model could uh, amplify the historical bias. So in the end of the day, it's your job as a product manager, because model is going to be a product to make sure that the product works as expected, is evaluated objectively, and is used responsibly. We can say 
do no harm to one of the things that we need to keep in mind when working on machine learning, especially in sensitive areas. Next one, evangelize the champions attack. Uh, already touched uh, upon that before, but ultimately, in many cases, machine learning is either perceived as a, in a magical black box, completely opaque, or as a magic wand, like with no limitation, can do anything. Both are obviously quite extreme point of views. And the people who view it as black box uh, typically also distrust it, at least to some degree. And people who are overly optimistic, who think it's a magic wand, they have a realistic expectation about what they can achieve with that. Often, the job of educating your stakeholders uh, on the actual benefits and actual capabilities, as well as drawbacks and costs of machine learning, is going to be the PM's job. Uh, so again, uh, this goes back to understanding the tech, but also a little bit of soft skills about how you teach that to the right people and get the buy-in. Next one, regulations. So as I discussed, the two fundamental blocks of ML is data and algorithm, and both can be affected by existing or upcoming regulations. That's why it's important for you to monitor them. First of all, be up to speed on everything that's already in place, and also keep an eye on what's upcoming. Uh, there are a lot of regulations regarding privacy, and in some case, uh, competition that may limit access to the data that you can use for training new models. And there are other regulations that are upcoming most at this point that can limit the application of ML for particular problems and may uh, impose specific requirements on the transparency of algorithms. So I guess, I guess I don't have to explain to you that need to comply with laws, but um, I strongly recommend taking it one step further. So laws are coming from uh, a place of actual concern, right? I mean, some problems been observed uh, in the past. For example, we have uh, excessive use, untransparent use of user data for training algorithms that modify the behavior. Uh, for example, or uh absolutely uh how should I, like proprietary algorithm meaning like uh, uh opaque to anyone being used for making i don't know college admission decision so uh those are real problems that actually exist uh, in the real world so the regulations are continuously catching up with all of them so I suggest that you comply with those regulations, so maybe you even preempt those regulations on your site to put in the needed controls in place and the transparency features, because this is how you build trust with your end users as well, and also how you build trust with your external stakeholders, such as regulators, if you have to. So a little bit more about types of regulations that you need to be aware of. First of all, it's data privacy laws. Um, there are a few examples of them. GDPR is Europe is one, uh, California Consumer Privacy Act is the other one. Uh, there are also pretty much in any part of the world right now exists some regulations that covers uh, how you can or cannot collect and use uh, uh, user data and uh, what kind of controls you need to put in place uh, for users to be able to, you know, agree or disagree with the use of those data. Then there is antitrust laws. They are probably more relevant if you're going to work for large companies, which occupy a dominant position, for example, in uh, online advertising or commerce, because that would prevent uh, those companies from using the data from uh, the market where they're already dominant to boost their position in another market that they're trying to enter. Now, artificial intelligence. Uh, you have probably all aware uh, you probably have heard about uh, progress with uh, artificial intelligence generative artificial intelligence to be more specific and uh, a major public debate around it uh, so in uh, many different regions uh, like countries uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, work happening on preparing the new regulations that will govern how AI is used can be used or cannot be used and under what conditions, with what transparency mechanism in place. So I'll keep an eye on that. It's going to be developing very fast, I expect. And one more, uh, which is recently 
we, we, which is like a re really recent development and really caught my attention. I think it's very interesting. And other things that uh, generative AI uh, discussions revealed or maybe highlighted is uh, the issue of copyright. For example, generative uh, models wanted to produce, uh, you know, say, uh, imagery or video. Uh, they were trained on data scraped from internet, and a lot of those scraped data contained work on many different artists, designers, and so on. And those data were scraped used without their uh, knowledge or consent. And then um, there is a threat that these uh, generative AI models will be used by people to actually circumvent going to like designers or artists. So instead of going to them, people are going to use these models instead. So. Uh, the work of those designers and those artists was used to actually reduce their potential impact in the future. So a lot of discussions about the copyright uh, uh, for training data for generative AI uh, have been happening lately. So I'm really curious to see where it will end up. And you need to look at it. Uh, sorry, you need to follow it if you're going to work on ML uh, in this area because of my impact, what data you can actually gather for training your models. And the last one, uh, scalability. So one of the points that I've been making is that uh, ML is specialized and ML is expensive. So you really need to make sure that if you invest in ML, your company in general needs to be sure, but you as well, as product manager, the representative of business side uh, in development, you need to plan for scalability, how you're gonna use uh, the models or the team, the team's capabilities to generate more and more uh, impact for the company. So on one side, you should be considering how you can scale an existing solution. Developing even a single model is really good, typically a quite long and heavy investment. So you might want to think about different ways you can use output on the same model for different use cases. At the same time, you should always think ahead of uh, what other problems your team could solve and start preparing those cases in advance. So uh, you get better and better ROI on machine learning investment. That was eight, the four points that I wanted to stress about the additional expectation of machine learning product managers. Um, and now I would like to go and talk about a little bit more on different path, how you can become a machine learning product manager if you chose so. Here is uh, three options that I identified uh, in, uh, uh, I would say, in, in the order of increasing complexity or maybe boldness. Uh, the most obvious uh, path is, of course, to join companies that already does machine learning. Typically, those companies also. <clears throat> support on the job training and transfer between a male and non-ML team. So if you join the company as uh, even as a regular ML, you can over time transfer to a machine learning team and get ramped up there. This uh, usually the companies that do ML are also large companies and they may have also associate or rotational PM programs for people who are just entering this uh, uh, specialization. Uh, for them, this option should also be available. Another one, and this is an option for most senior PMs, is to pitch investment into ML in the company where you currently work. If you have enough sway with the leadership and you believe that you're identifying a good portfolio of machine learning projects uh, that could benefit your company, you can try to pitch it as a business case and see if you can persuade the leadership to invest. Well, and finally, and this is for the boldest manas, you can always, consider starting your own ML company. If you have the right expertise, or you have a partner who has the right expertise, and you think you see a nice uh, business opportunity for that, I would recommend trying. I think it would be amazing. And uh, this is all for me today. So let's quickly recap. The key takeaways that I ultimately want you to remember is first of all, that machine and PM are still PMs. So creating a clarity for your stakeholders on the priorities, success definitions, and the immediate next steps is your bread and butter.
However, if you choose to work on machine learning, there are a few more things that you will have to do. First, you need to bring yourself up to speed on the technology, its requirements, its capabilities and limitations, and be able to teach that technology and the product and your team to all the relevant stakeholders. You will also need to monitor the existing and upcoming regulations because it can impact uh, your portfolio of data and your portfolio of algorithm that you can use. And you need to always plan for scalability to get a good ROI on machine learning investment for a company. And finally, there are different paths available to become a machine learning PM. The easiest one of them would be to join a machine learning company and over time, if not straight away, join a machine learning team and start practicing ML. And this is it for me today. Uh, Thank you for listening. I hope you heard something new uh, and interesting for yourself. And if you have any more questions or just like to get in touch, please reach out via LinkedIn. That is it. Uh, thanks again and have a great day.